Well, if you would please open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3 this morning. Colossians in the third chapter. We just kind of kind of build up to where we are this morning because it really ties in with what we looked at for the previous two Sundays. In the book of Colossians, Paul is dealing with false teaching that is creeping into the Colossian church and a combination or a mixture of Gnostic ideas, okay? Basically a type of new age ideology for them. But not just a new age that's by itself, a new age that's mixed up with religion. And so he, he, first of all, he lays out, you know, he says, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that God would open your understanding and that you'd be a, a, a church with Christ as the head. And by the way, remember, he's the preeminence in all things because he's the creator. He's the sustainer of all life. And, and really, it's all about Jesus. And he, he goes on and, and he talks about the fact in, in chapter two, you know, in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so you don't need to go looking anywhere else for wisdom and knowledge other than to Christ. And he goes on to talk about the fact that in him we are complete in Christ. You don't need to add to Jesus. It's not Jesus plus something else, not Jesus plus psychology, Jesus plus philosophy, and certainly not Jesus plus religion. And so then he begins to condemn all of the isms that we talked about. The ism of legalism. Thinking that somehow keeping the law makes you right with God. Or the legalism or or the the ism of mysticism. And that is this Gnostic idea that that you got to talk to angels or, or something super spiritual and mystical like that. And finally the ism of asceticism. This harsh treatment of the body, going without all of these things and, and, and trying to hurt yourself through food or through what you touch or, you know, wearing a camel hair garment or heard the other day that they make these belts that have nails in them so that as you move about that it tears the flesh, you know, and, and, and he basically says in verse 23, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, but in any, uh, <clears throat> not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. In other words, this is all a waste of time. This is all worthless. So when I use the word religion, what I mean is that stuff, religious ritual, legalism, religious practice, wearing certain garments or going to certain uh, uh, rituals, performing these kind of things, and uh, uh, you know, talking about different days or different foods and all of this kind of stuff. And so what he's going to do is he's going to transition from that. He's saying, look, if you know Christ, it shouldn't lead you into those things. It certainly shouldn't lead you back into the Old Testament. If you know Christ, what it should do is it should lead you to where we're going in chapter 3. So let's pick up there in chapter 3. And let's begin reading there in verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Let's stop there and let's pray. Father, we just come to you once again and ask for your help in understanding the word of God. Help us to apply it to our lives. God, we just love you and we thank you for Jesus. It truly is all about him and we want to give him the preeminence in everything in our lives. And we know, Lord, that that he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And so help us, Lord, to set our affection on, on Christ this morning and on things that are seated up there with him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so if it's not about religion and religious practices and it's not about asceticism, mysticism, legalism, and all of these kind of things, then what is it about? What is it? When you, when you truly have a relationship with Christ, what is going to happen and what should happen in your life? Well, number one, you need to see yourself in Christ. You need to see yourself the way that God sees you. Look there, chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ. There's not one person alive who has ever read those words who has been risen up, bodily resurrected from the dead, except maybe Lazarus, but I doubt he was around by this time. There's nobody that that applies to physically, okay? 
So what he's saying is, is if you have new life in Christ, you know, when you got saved, God did something incredible spiritually to you. He took you and transported you back to the cross and you got nailed to the cross with Jesus. You, you, you laid in the ground with Jesus. You got resurrected from the dead with Jesus. You got placed in Christ. So if, since Christ is raised from the dead, if you're in him, then you are raised, raised from the dead. What this is, these four verses, this is a positional statement. One of the things we're going to talk about today is the difference between position and condition. There are things that the Bible says are true of you if you're lost. There are things the Bible says are true of you if you're saved. Those are positional. You may not experience them. You may not understand them. You can talk to a lost person. A lot of times they won't know that they are lost. They, 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 they don't understand any of these things. But positionally, it is true of them. And for us as believers, the Bible says things about us that we may not feel or see or experience or know that that is some, something that's happening in our lives. It's something that we must hear and believe and then see how that fleshes out in the future. Those are positional statements. Ephesians and Colossians are loaded with them. And this is one of them. If you then be risen with Christ. That is a positional statement. If you are saved and you are in Christ. My Bible representing Jesus. This piece of paper representing me. If I am in Christ and Christ is raised from the dead, then I am raised with Christ. That is a positional statement that is true of me. So think about it. When I was in high school, there were different groups of people, okay? And they got labeled, all right? Now, I don't, I, I don't know if you went to the same kind of high school I did, but when I, came to, uh, when I came to San Angelo, I heard a different word for one of these groups that I don't like at all. But anyway... We had the jocks, right? Everybody knows what the jocks are, right? They're the letter jacket guys and gals. They're the, you know, the cheerleaders. They, they played football and basketball and baseball, you know. And, and most of the time the jocks wore, we didn't get to wear shorts to school. So most of the time jocks wore blue jeans, tennis shoes, t-shirts, and letter jackets in August. Because you got to let everybody know that you're a jock, right? Even though it's 100 degrees outside and you're wearing a letter jacket. And then we had the preps. You know, the, the preps, they're the ones who watched uh, The Breakfast Club and tried to be like Ducky or Pretty in Pink or something like that. But the preps, you know, they, they were all, boy, they were fancy, always dressed to the nines. Boy, they had on, had on their, their, their pleated uh, pants, zoot suit kind of pants and penny loafers and stuff. Man, boat shoes, you know. Man, they were slick. And boy, they all got fixed their hair, put stuff in their hair, okay? Doesn't matter what stuff it is. You put stuff, your mail, you put stuff in your hair, your prep, okay? Uh, that, that's, that was the group you fit into. And then there were the stomps. Now, that's what I called them because a true cowboy is a cowboy, period. That's all there is to it. But the wannabes, I, we called them stomps. In Texas, they call them kickers. I never heard that word. A kicker was a type of speaker when I was in high school. But anyway, I came to Texas, hear this word kicker. And you know these guys, these guys wear boots, jeans, belts, giant surf bucket lid belt buckle about this big around, two class every day, usually wearing their letter jacket, right? And uh, not their letter jacket, their FFA jacket. So, um, and then, then there was, let's see, whatever, whatever, what other groups were there? Uh, well, of course, there were the nerds, you know, the, they had the, the nerdy kids and poor, bless their hearts, they they just didn't really fit in anywhere. That's kind of where I was. But uh, uh, just so you know, my attire when I went to high school is uh, blue jeans, usually Levi's, uh, a shirt like this, untucked with the sleeves rolled up, uh, tennis shoes, untucked, by the way, untucked, untucked, moms, never, ever, like ever did I ever tuck it in, no belt, uh, tennis shoes, not with the tongues hanging out. Uh, didn't do that. Did not roll the tight rolls. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Some of these kids are going, oh, I have no idea what he's talking about. Anyway, uh, or a t-shirt. They, they wouldn't let us. We were supposed to, you could only wear a certain, you couldn't wear like a Nike t-shirt or whatever for whatever reason. So, so we wore like golf shirts, collared t-shirts, you know, untucked, tennis shoes, blue jeans, and uh, didn't have a letter jacket, <clears throat> didn't have a ring, uh, and I never wore a hat a day ever, ever to school, ever, ever, because you couldn't wear it inside 
and it'll shrink in the pickup. So anyway, but, but uh, what is that? That is a search. Oh, wait, we had another group. We had the motorheads. Oh, yes, the motorheads. They, and, 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 you know, they hung out the auto mechanic steel. Uh, they usually had grease on them in some, some place, some shape, form. They were working on their car at lunchtime. These guys, these guys were fun to hang out with because they had the cool cars. They were usually broke down, but they had cool cars. Uh, some of them didn't run or have tires on them. But, uh, so we had the motorheads. We had the jocks. We had the preps. We had the, uh, what else? Who else did we have? We had, uh, we had uh, what's that? Yeah, let, well, those, that's what I would call the jocks. Put them in that group. Um, who else? We only had one of those. And I mean, there were the goth. She says the gothic kids. We, we had one. I, you know, he, he was trying to make a statement and bless his heart. We just classified him with the nerds. So, uh, but you, you had all these groups of people. And, you know, and, and what's, here's what's fun about it. I had friends in every group. Uh Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. What did I do? She says, go on, stop bashing on everybody. But I have a point to this, and this is important. Every one of those kids dressed in a certain way because they were trying to fit in with a certain group. Because they were trying to build an identity. I am trying to, I want you to see who I am. I'm not like them, but I want to be like them. I want to hang out with this group. And maybe some from this group wanted to be in this group, and maybe some from this group wanted to be in this group. And what was fun is, as I was in FFA, I never wore my FFA jacket to school a day in my life, ever. I hid it out in my pickup. I didn't want anyone to see it until it was time. But when it was time, I went and put it on and went to my FFA meeting like I was supposed to. Uh, but, but what those kids were all, all of us were trying to do is we're trying to fit in. We're trying to find a slot. We're trying to... We're trying to, to, to come up with some kind of an identity. And people do it today, too. People always do this. I mean, you, you've got this professional identity or this particular, I want to identify with this group over here. Or I wanna, and, and people do it with their job. They do it with their hobby. They do it with, with uh, the, the, the group that they hang out with. They try. So there's some people who want to be. I had one friend, and he wanted to be identified as wealthy, even though he wasn't. And he spent a lot of money on clothes, a lot of money. And he made sure that you knew how much his shoes cost and how much the, you know, he, he was a, a, a label guy. I would call this group the label guy. Made sure that you could see the label, you know, the little alligator or whatever on his shirt. Because that was important to him. And yet I knew him and I knew him pretty well. And they weren't wealthy. His family was not wealthy. But he tried to portray that out there. Here's the thing. The most important thing as a Christian that you can do is find your identity in Christ. That's what Colossians is all about. You will not find your identity in legalism, mysticism, asceticism, or any of these religious practices. And if you try to, you're just wasting your time. The point of Colossians 3, 1 through 4 is that our identity is found in Jesus. When we trust Christ, it doesn't matter whether we were a jock or a stomp or a, 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 a whatever, whatever those groups are. All of that is gone now. Look, look with me there in verse 11. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew. We're, we're done with national ideologies. Circumcision nor uncircumcision. That's religious stuff. We're done with all of that. Barbarian, Scythian. This is uh, uh, someone who's not a Roman. We're done with that. Bond or free. We're, we're done with that. We're done with these ideologies. Masters and slaves. We're done with all of that. But Christ is all and in all. Amen. This is why when you go to church, you ought to go to church with rich people and poor people. You ought to go to church with, with different people ethnicities of people. The church is made up of the people who have been born again and they come from every tribe, every tongue, every nation on the earth. Red, brown, yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. And when we come to faith in Christ, that is what brings us together, is now our new identity in Christ. We don't lose our individual personhood 
And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. There's nothing wrong with the smart kids at school. There's nothing wrong with the athletic kids at school. There's nothing wrong with the cowboys. There's nothing wrong with the guys who like to work on their cars. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. The, the, the reality is, is that the lost world always is seeking for identity. Right now, you're seeing a confused world that doesn't know whether they're male or female. And they're trying to try out the other side or, or to change the way that God has made them. And, and they're so unbelievably confused. If they would just stop all of that foolishness and come to Jesus, they would find that their, their true self is not found in, well, it's not found in you. It's found in Him. That's where your true self is. Look there with me. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. We just sang about seeking for the things of God this morning. Seek the things that are above. Think about how hard men seek for stuff on this earth. He says, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Seek heavenly things. Set your affection. What is it that you love? What is it that you want desperately? You know, I mean, think about all the many things that people are, are seeking after. Men seek for gold and men seek for power and they seek for influence and they seek for information and they seek for all of these things. And yet the word of God tells us, seek for these things up above. Seek for them in heavenly places. Seek for them in Christ, not on things on the earth. You know, there's nothing wrong with scientifically studying this earth. There's nothing wrong with studying human nature and things like that. But there is something very wrong with trying to find the truth and the origins and the true answers in all of those directions because you're never going to find it. Science will take you so far. Science will take you back to a rock. And that's it. That's as far as you can go. Where did the rock come from? God's word tells us that, you see. And so if we'll seek for the answer above, it will help us in our seek and our search for stuff that's going on down here. So then he tells us in verse 3, he says, For ye are dead. Now watch the transition. Back to chapter 2 and verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. You see, you used to be, when you were lost, you were dead to God, alive to sin. But now in Christ, you're dead to sin and alive to God. This must happen. There's got to be a death. You were born dead. You inherited that from Adam. Dead to God, alive to sin. But something's got to happen in your life. You've got to have a new birth. And when you are born again, now you're alive to God and dead to sin and dead to the things of this lost world. You are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So if your life is hidden, where are you going to find it? Well, you're not going to find it in the things of this earth. You're going to find it in Christ, where it's hidden, with God. Amen? Can you see that? So, back to chapter 2, and verse 3. In Christ, he says, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And in chapter 3, and verse 3, it says, ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So, think about it. If you want to find the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and you want to find out who you are, what your identity is, both of those answers are to be found in Christ. So if you will search in the place, it's like a lot of times we lose things at our house. Me, Kyra, not so much Kyra. Me, David, Katie, Josie, and Julia. But especially me and Julia, we're the losers. Okay? Now let me, know, let me show you, to explain to you what I mean by that. We lose stuff. We lose wallets. We lose... Um, notebooks, we lose school books, we lose iPads, we lose, mom is the finder. But one of the ways that mom finds things for us is to point us in the direction of where we should look, right? So I'll be looking outside for something and she'll go, well, do you think it's going to be out there? Where did you lose it at? Well, I don't know. I probably lost it in the kitchen. Well, then don't you think you ought to look in the kitchen? <gasps> oh, you see, and, and that's, that's what we, I mean, that's kind of the aha moment of Colossians 3. If you want to find your life, Stop looking in the wrong place. Your life will not be found here on this earth. 
Your knife will not be found in your job, in your hobby, in your joy, in you know, the thing that, you know, your little happy place. Your life's not going to be found in shopping or in building a bigger business. That is not going to find your, you're not going to find your life in that. You're going to find your life in Christ. And when you find that, you're going to find all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now that's exciting to me. I don't know about you, but, but I think that's incredibly exciting. So we should be seeking Matthew 6.33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Did you know that this morning many, 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 many people got up and they went to seek for their life on a golf course, on a lake, uh, in front of a TV, uh, with some friends somewhere, uh, in some, some uh, hobby, some thing. They went looking for all of those things. And yet God's word says, if you really want to find your life, It's going to be found by seeking first his kingdom and seeking his righteousness. And you need to look up. You need to look to Christ for those things. He says, when Christ, verse 4, who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. You know what that means? That means that the real you is going to always be hidden until the return of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? The real you, the absolute, true, complete, and total you is going to be hidden in Christ until he returns. And so if you really want to find out who that person is, it's not going to be found on this earth. It's going to be found in Christ, okay? Now, position. This is why I say you need to see yourself in Christ. This is a positional reality about you that God says is true of you. Next, we're going to talk about condition. So if we get the positional aspect right and we understand that and believe that, then we can flesh it out. How do I do this? What does it look like? Position, God says this is true. Condition, this is what's going on in my life. This is the stuff I can touch. This is the stuff I can see. This is the stuff I can handle. So let's pick up in verse 5. Mortify. Different word for that is slay or kill. All right? Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Number one, see yourself in Christ. Search for your life in Christ. Seek for the things that are above. Number two, slay your passions. Slay your passions. Right now, our world is ripping itself apart because of these passions that are listed right here on this. Because people don't want to be responsible for their own actions. They want to have the right to go and have an abortion. Because they're not willing to deal with their passions which got them into that place in the first place. Where right now we see this in so many areas within our lost world that people basically say, we're an animal. We want to live like an animal. We have no control of ourselves. We see food. We get hungry. We want to eat. We see something that arouses us. We want to breed just like an animal. I was watching a discovery thing or something the other day and they were talking about the Arctic and they were showing all these animals coming out of hibernation. Grizzly bears and, and uh, ground squirrels and all these things, they come out of hibernation and what do they do? They eat and they breed and then they go back into hibernation. And our world acts like that's what we are, that, that human beings act like that. But listen to me, you're not an animal. I don't care what science told you, you're not an animal. You're not a mammal. You are a human being created in the image of God, totally different than every other animal on this planet, not even close to the same in so many different ways. But here's the thing. If you are in Christ, 
Now what we need to do is, is we need to take that truth and put it into practice in our life and we need to slay these passions. These are things we are to do. The other part, the first four verses, is something we are to believe. We believe these things and we begin to seek for things above and then we can flesh it out. How? Kill it. You need to kill fornication in your life. Guess what? The sex drive is from God. It is a God-given thing to be aimed in a particular direction. You know, a gun, a gun is an incredible tool. It is a fantastic tool that has been used again and again and again and again and again to protect and to put food on the table. But if aimed in the wrong direction, it is unbelievably destructive. Well, guess what? A fire is an incredible tool. It is a fantastic tool. A fire can do so many things. It can cook, it can warm, it can transform something from one physical chemical state to another physical chemical state. However, if it is in the wrong place, it's one of the most destructive things on the planet. And your sex drive is exactly the same way. Look what he says here. He says, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. What are your members? Well, that's the parts of you. It can be used to describe a part of your body. It can be used to describe a part of your soul. And so he says, you need to kill these things. You don't need to put up with them and you don't need to try to tame them. You need to kill them. You need to kill them dead. Mortify. Okay. So he says, what are those things that are upon the earth? Well, he starts the list with fornication. Why do you think he starts the list with fornication? Because it's so destructive. Because it's so powerful. You say, well, what's fornication, preacher? Well, it's simple. It's sexual intercourse anywhere outside of marriage, period. That's all there is to it. And if, you know, we would not be having a Roe versus Wade debate and discussion in this country if fornication were slain in the lives of Americans. It'd be done. It wouldn't exist. You wouldn't have an AIDS debate and discussion if fornication were dealt with wouldn't exist. Those things wouldn't even, monkeypox wouldn't exist. Th those kind of things would not be here. Those things we have brought upon ourselves because of sin completely out of control in our world. By the way, it was out of control in Paul's day too. That's why he had to write about it. And it was out of control in Sodom. And it was out of control from, from the garden. When Adam ate that fruit, all of this stuff went it was just like taking a watch, opening it up, and letting the mainspring pop out. That's what happened. Man, stuff went everywhere. And it's a mess to this day. But you are different. Why are you different? Because you're in Christ. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you. Because now you know Jesus. Because you are born again. Because your life will not be found here on this earth. Your life will not be defined by sexual conquest. Your life will be found in Him, in Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father. You'll understand your life through the Word as the Holy Spirit lines that up for you. And you will find the greatest fulfillment of your life in marriage. One man with one woman, united in Christ, becoming one flesh. That is where you will find this incredible joy that God has given to us. And so, so he says, mortify these things. Mortify fornication. You can't play with it. You can't tame it. You can't pet it. You can't train on it. You can't try to direct it. You have to kill it. Uncleanness. This one has to do with sexual ideology as well. Inordinate affection. That's just a big way to say lust. Just lust. The desire to have something that doesn't belong to you. Evil concupiscence. That is a longing is what that is. It's a longing for something and especially for something forbidden or taboo and covetousness and then and remember what is covetousness well the prohibition against covetousness is the 10th commandment right so you start out commandments do 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 you get to the end the last one is covetousness and Paul said that's the one that gets me every time I've been doing so good I get down the list and covetousness comes and wham it slays me why because I find it in me but he goes even a step further and he says what well, covetousness is actually idolatry. Because when you want something that is not yours to have, you are going to be taking your worship off of Jesus and you're going to be putting it somewhere else. 
Covetousness is probably the most dangerous of all because that's where a lot of this stuff starts. It starts in the heart by wanting something you can't have and then you go to trying to figure out how I can get it, okay? And so he tells us here in verse 6 and 7 what happens with this and, he, and where, it, where you used to be in it. He says, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. In other words, what he's saying is, he says, look, the lost world lives like this. This is what the lost world looks like. Don't be like the lost world. Turn with me over to Ephesians, just two books back, chapter 5. Ephesians and Philippians have an awful lot of parallels in them. They're very similar to each other. And he says there uh, in uh, uh, Ephesians 5, 6, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Now look at verse 7. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. You know what this stuff is. You know this is why the wrath of God comes. God's wrath comes on this world because of sin. Verse 7, back to Colossians 3, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. This is how you used to live when you were lost before you knew Jesus. You were dominated by these passions. You lived in these things. But don't partake with them in these things. So how do you slay these things in your life? Well, be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little ears what you hear. Be careful little feet where you go. Be careful little hands what you touch. Now, hang on. Go back with me. Go back with me to chapter 2, verse 22, verse 21. Touch not, taste not, handle not. I thought you said we didn't have to mess with that, preacher. Ah, isn't this wonderful? You see, what he's telling us here is, is your motivation. Why do you not want to touch those things, taste those things, or handle those things? Are you trying to make yourself right by not touching those things, tasting those things, and handling those things? If you are, you'll fail every single time because that's asceticism. You are trying to discipline the body into righteousness. You're never going to do that. He doesn't say to, to try to avoid those things. He says, mortify them. Mortify them. See, it doesn't do enough to just watch what you look at. You have to deal with the heart. You've got to deal with the heart. And so, so as a Christian, you've got to have your complete, your complete being transformed. Romans 12. Be not conformed to this world. Just step back and ask yourself the question. If I were charged with being a Christian, is there enough evidence to convict me? Or do I look just like the lost world? Do I like the same things as the lost world? Do I, do I go to the same places as the lost world? Do I talk like the lost world and walk like the lost world? If it quacks like a duck and swims like a duck, it's probably a duck. You see, but when the heart is transformed and I begin to seek those things that are above what I deal with is, is I kill that junk in me. And I go to work putting that stuff to death. If I kill it in here, I can walk right past it here. And it's not going to be something that, that I'm infatuated with. I love the, I love the idea of the, of the bunny rabbit. You know, if you take a bunny rabbit and you take a wolf, right? If I lay a steak and a, and a pile of head of lettuce out there, the wolf is never going to choose the lettuce. He can't eat it. And if before he starves to death, he probably might chew on it a little bit, but he'll never choose it. The wolf will choose the steak every single time. The bunny rabbit, he won't mess with the steak ever. He's always going to choose the lettuce. That's what he, his nature leads him to that. Well, what God does when you come to Christ is he takes the heart of the bunny and puts it in the wolf. And now the wolf wants the green stuff. You see, that's what he's done in you. You need to know that. You need to believe that. And when you believe that, you begin to realize hey, I've got a different taste. I've got a different appetite. I don't want the things of this world anymore because that's the kind of stuff God's going to judge this world for. That's how I used to live. He says, in the which ye also walked, verse 7, sometime when ye lived in them. He goes on, he says, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. You put these off, okay? 
Now, here's what's, here's what's interesting. The Greek word to put off is exactly the same Greek word that's translated spoiled back in chapter 2 and verse 15. So look with me at that verse. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. There's no way to read that without hearing that Jesus whipped those evil, wicked angels, defeated them, and then took all of their stuff away from them. That's what that says. Well, that's what it means to put off. You whip fornication, malice, and filthy communication out of your mouth. You whip that in your own life. You spoil it and take its stuff and ruin it forever. That's what we must do. You don't play with sin. You don't fiddle with it. You kill it. That's the whole point. So you got to see yourself in Christ and you got to slay your passions. But that's not it. That's not the end of it. Okay. I told this story at the camp meeting. It was a little bit more effective there, I think, than it will be here. But let's say you want to quit dipping Copenhagen. Okay. I got a friend and he, uh, boy, it was funny. Everybody there, amen, amen. I said, let's talk about quitting Copenhagen. It got real quiet. And then afterwards, two or three of them old boys come up and say, what are you picking on Copenhagen for? I'm not picking on Copenhagen. I'm just saying I've got a lot of friends who decided that 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 wasn't something they wanted in their life. And so they tried to quit. We could put this, we could talk about smoking in exactly the same way. How many people do you know who've tried to quit smoking or dipping, chewing tobacco? And they quit and they stayed quit for a little while. And then everything caught up to them one day and they picked it back up again. And then they found that the next time it was twice as hard to quit. And then they messed around, they quit again. And then something went along for a little while, especially ladies trying to quit smoking. And what do they do? they start gaining weight and boy they pick up those smokes again because that keeps them from eating stuff and they go to losing weight again you know and and every time you try that the next time it just gets that much harder can I get a witness I've talked to hundreds of people in my life that all say exactly the same thing well here's the deal anytime you remove or kill something in your life you have got to fill the slot it's like a dry socket in your mouth you can't just leave it open. It's, it's like a hole in the yard. You got to fill it in. You dig the tree up, you got to put something back in the hole. And that's what God's word says to do. You put off these things, but you got to put on something new. So look what he says. <clears throat> you see yourself in Christ. You slay your passions. And number two, the second part of our condition is to suit up with Christ. You're going to take off that old dirty yucky, tarnished, stinking, filthy garment of the flesh. And you're going to go and you're going to put on the beautiful, righteous garment of Christ, shining, sparkly white, and you're going you're gonna to change clothes. That's what you've got to do. You mortify your passions and you suit up with Christ. Look there with me at verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Can you hear it? Put off these things. Put on these things. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Oh, that's position. He says that of me. I'm chosen. I got picked for God's team. I like that. Holy. I like that one, too. You ever heard anybody, you know, I'm no angel. No, you're not. But if you're in Christ, you are holy. Well, I don't feel holy. Well, that's why this is a positional statement. God says this is true of you. Why? Because he took you out of a lost world. He snatched you out from under his wrath. And he put you in Christ. Now he sees you as if you are holy. And beloved. And that one is my favorite. I am loved by God. I heard a guy say one time, and I've used it many times since then. I called him up. I said, Marty, how you doing? He said, blessed and highly favored by God. Well, I said, amen. But the more I went along my day, I thought about it and I said, amen and amen and amen. And, and now I use it a lot because it's true. It's true. If I'm in Christ, I am elect. I am chosen. I am holy and I am beloved. And he loves me. He loves me so much. He gave his son for me. So that's my position. So he says, as this kind of a person, put off that junk and put on something different. What's this new suit of clothes look like? Well, he says, first of all, it has bowels of mercies. Be a merciful person. Care about other people. Kindness. 
We're to be kind as followers of Jesus. We have to put on kindness. Kindness isn't something... <clears throat> Let me see. I have, a, I have a quote about these things. And it's written in my Bible. This is free. I just thought of this. And now you watch. I'm not going to be able to find it. All right, I'll find it here in a minute. Anyway, let's go on. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to find kindness by looking for it here on this earth. I'm going to find kindness by looking to God. God is kind. You know, God, you know how God, kind God is? He causes it to rain on the just as well as the unjust. That's how kind God is. And so I'm to be merciful. I'm to be kind. Humbleness of mind. I'm to humble myself under the mighty hand of God. This is something I have to put on. I, I, I am to do this. Meekness. I'm to be meek and gentle like a broke horse. Not a rebellious wild animal, but a broke horse. Somebody who is ready to obey the master. We watched a show about a service dog last night, a military service dog. Man, unbelievably dangerous animal. Scares me to death. Dog, ooh, dog bite, terrible, awful. Watched the training. We went out one time when Mr. Anderson was out at the base and watched him do some stuff with dogs. And, whew. Uh, shotgun uh, is the only thing I can think of that would, would make me not absolutely mortified of those animals. But to watch the way that they listen to their handlers. You see, that's what the, the Bible word for meekness is. Broke, trained, terribly powerful, unbelievably dangerous, able to do anything. And see, one of the things that guys a lot of times, you know, we want to, uh, 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 you know, we break things and tear things up and go, you know, do all this, and we don't like words like meek because that makes us sound weak. It has nothing to do with being weak at all. It has to do with being broke. And the best horses are broke. You touch them with the reins, and they move. You touch them with your foot, and they give to that pressure, and they respond to the rider. They respond to the owner. Well, you and I, we belong to Jesus, and we should be as powerful as He has built us to be but broke. In other words, if he says, whoa, we stop. If he says, go, we go. That's what meekness means. And so he says, uh, a long suffering to, to put up with stuff for a long time. Listen, if you're going to live in this world, you got to be long suffering. If you're going to have a marriage that lasts for a long time, you got to, you, you ladies, you got to put up with your husband. It's just, just all there is to it. Sorry. Heard a great quote the other day. This lady was upset with her husband. He had done something he shouldn't have done. And she was, she was, you know, she was mad at him. And he came and he apologized. And he says, well, I said, I'm sorry. This was Isaiah on Little House on the Prairie. You see who this was. He said, I said, I'm sorry. And she said, you've said you were sorry before, but you don't change. And he says, well, what'd you marry me for if you wanted me to change? Why didn't you marry the guy you wanted to change me into? And I just died laughing. I'm like, amen. That's what every husband is thinking right now. But you see, God does change us. He takes us from that wild, rebellious, lost, sinful person that we are. He gives us a new life. He doesn't tell us, clean yourself up and then I'll accept you. He takes you from where you are. You die. That old person dies. He gives you a new life. And then he gives you the power and the ability to change into what he wants for you to look like. And that's what we're talking about here. So we're putting on this new life, long suffering. Look at verse 13, forbearing one another. What this part is, is explaining to us what the long suffering means. Forbearing one another in the church, in the family, putting up with it one another and forbearing one another and forgiving one another. When we become followers of Jesus, we become the forgiveness of sins people. We forgive. And look what he says. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Freely you have received, freely give. You've received forgiveness freely. How do I forgive people who have wronged me? Well, Jesus died for their sin too. Whether they know it or not, it doesn't matter. He died for their sin too. So it's already been paid for. You say, you know, this is why vengeance dies. By the way, I don't know if anybody watches my little deals that I put on Facebook and YouTube, but of all of the ones that I've done, 
the most views that I've ever gotten was on one. Well, the most views I've ever gotten, I did with one with Wendy. That one got more views, so I don't know why I mess with it. I should get her to do these. But anyway, the second most views I've ever gotten, I did one on how to deal with wicked people. And it gets searched, it gets looked at, it gets shared, and it gets debated. And what's so fun is, is I hardly ever respond to any of the things that people say, but most people don't like it. Because I talked about, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. As followers of Jesus, we are called to forgive. We are, call, we are not called to be the punisher. We're just not. That's not our job. We are called to pray and love and forgive and to actually love our enemies. And boy, oh boy, people do not like that message. And they accuse me of being weak and they accuse me of teaching pacifism and I'm doing neither and none of those things. All I'm doing is sharing what the word of God teaches us. We are to be the forgiveness of sins people. That's who we're supposed to be. By the way, should evil be punished? Absolutely. It's one of the reasons why we've got to hold our elected officials accountable for what they do because the very next verse is behind that in Romans chapter 12 where it says not to, to, to carry out vengeance. It talks about civil government and the government does not bear the sword in vain. Should there be a death penalty? Yes, sir. Should we have police? Absolutely. Should bad people be arrested? You betcha. Should they be tried? You betcha. And they should be punished to the full extent of the law, but it's not up to me to do it. It's up to me to take part in a civil government system that takes care of those things. And when we have corrupt officials and corrupt district attorneys and corrupt uh, officials who refuse to punish violent criminals, we need to vote them out, vote someone in who will do their job. And we need to work through the, uh, uh, the lawful means to do it. Amen? But it's a Bible 101, I'm pretty sure. But we got to learn to forgive. We're the forgiveness of sins people. Verse 14, and above all these, put on charity. That's love. That's the God kind of love. That's agape love. Above all of these, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. Man, I like that. I just couldn't get past that as I keep reading this. I'm like, what is the bond? You know, uh, bond you bond something together, you, you glue it, you, you, you bind it together. Uh, there's different kinds of bonds. There's chemical bonds. And, you know, when I make knives, I use a chemical bond to hold it all together. In other words, I use epoxy or JB Weld. But I also use physical bonds as well. I use pins and things like that. And so if you, if you really want something to stay where it is, you need to use more than one different kind of bond. One of the coolest things in the whole wide world to me, I, I just find this fascinating, is to butcher an animal. When you butcher an animal, you want to talk about something that's put together well. When you look at bones and sinew and tendons and muscles and nerves and fat, and you see how all of that works together and that this animal can actually run and jump. I watched a video the other day of a grizzly bear catching a ground squirrel and eating it head first. It was awesome. But you want to know what's incredible? A 1,500-pound grizzly bear can move just as fast as a deer. Now, who did that? It sure wasn't an accident. God designed these creatures, and he bound them together so tight that they can give without breaking many times. Sometimes they break, but they can go a long ways before they do. And when you see how he built that and how he tied all that together, and then you look at the best that we can build and it's not even close to what God can do. Something as strong as bone and yet flexible to a certain degree. That's amazing. The bonds between joints that hold them together. It's incredible to see that. What is it that holds us together? The bond of love. Love is the stuff that sticks together. You want a marriage to last? It's bound together with love. You want a family to last? It's bound together with love. You want a church to last? It's got to be bound together with love. Any other bond that you use is going to break. But God's love is what binds us together. He says, you need to put this on. Put on love for your brothers and sisters. Put on love for your neighbor. Put on love for your enemy. You have to put it on. You have to do away with the bad. You have to put on the good. And so he says in verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. What is the dominating controlling factor in our lives? Is it fear? No, it's peace. 
And we can have a peace that passes all understanding in Christ, but you have to put it on. You have to make a conscious effort when you get up in the morning and your heart is going, blah, 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 and your mind is going, whew, 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 whew. many times you lay down on, on your bed at night and you lay down and you're thinking about all the stuff you have to do tomorrow and you can't go to sleep. You have to put on peace. You have to put it on just like a, you have a suit of clothes. He says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you're called in one body. And then finally he says, and be ye thankful. Gratitude. Now, as we read down through this list, what's this sound like? What's this remind you of? Reminds me of the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. Reminds me of the list of stuff that we find in 1 Thessalonians. It reminds me, and and what you'll find is, is as you look through the New Testament epistles, you're going to see these things over and over and over. It reminds me of the list of virtues in 1 Peter. So then he says in verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Hey, listen, how am I going to have peace? Get into the word. How am I going to have this, put on this bond of love? Get into the word and let it rule. Let it dwell in you richly. Let peace rule in your heart, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Hey, sing to the Lord. Sing at church, sing in the, in the car. Uh, Michaela, and she traveled with us the other day. Mr. Roddy does some singing when he's driving down the road, huh? Yeah. So, so you, 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 you put this stuff on. He says uh, uh, in verse 17, and then he sums it up. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And this is how he sums it all up. So take your, take your Bible and make you a list. Take the stuff you're supposed to slay and make you a list, right? Take you one sheet of paper, draw a line down the middle. Slay and suit up and make this list. Go down through it. What do I need to slay? Now, some of that stuff on the slay list, you may not be just super dealing with right now. But I promise you, there'll be something on there. Maybe you say, well, I'm not dealing with any sexual immorality kind of stuff right now, but I sure am dealing with anger or I'm sure dealing with discontent or I'm dealing with some of this. Take that list of suit up, all of these things over here. Every one of these that I kill, I need to replace with one of these. I need to slay fornication and I need to put on love. I need to slay uh, uh, this malice, which is this ill content towards something. And I need to put on peace and let peace rule in my heart. I, I I need to stop watching this or reading this that makes me angry. And I need to let the word of Christ dwell in me richly. And I need to sing some psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I need to replace these things in my life. And what you'll find is, is every time you you set out to slay one of these, and you replace it with one of these, you're going to see your life shift. And you're going to see these things be more and more prevalent in your life. And you're going to see these things less and less. And every now and then one of them is going to raise its ugly head. And you're going to go back and you're going to see yourself in Christ. You're going to seek Christ where he is. You're going to kill this thing over here. And you're going to put one of these in place. And you're, or all of them, but take it one step at a time. And what you'll see is, is you'll see this transition take place. And it's very practical. Amen. Father, we just give you this time right now. Lord, we want to. We want to see ourselves the way that Jesus sees us, the way that you see us in Him, Lord. God, our, our old life's no good. We need, to, we need to die to that old life. We need to put it to death. And we need the new life that you give us in Christ. So help us, Lord, to, to slay those passions and suit up with the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen.